I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com, and I'm here with Alex Leaf of examine.com, and you're listening to episode 62 of Mastering Nutrition, where we talk about niacin part two, blood tests, foods, and supplements. This is Mastering Nutrition with Chris Masterjohn. Take control of your health, master the science, and apply it like a pro. Are, are, are you ready? Part two of niacin. I'm back here with Alex Leaf. And today we are talking about the practical side of niacin. How do you manage niacin nutritional status? What do you do for blood testing? How do you eat food? in order to get niacin? How do you have to process your food? Does the way you cook it matter? Does fermenting matter? Does souring matter? Does sprouting matter? Does protein intake, lifestyle, medication, all these things, how do they all matter? And then supplements. Should you be taking nicotinamide riboside? Should you be taking nicotine, nicotinamide mononucleotide? Should you be taking straight up nicotinic acid or niacinamide what should what dose should you take how should you take it how can we expect these things to have health outcomes to briefly review what we talked about last time we talked about the cases of John Julian Jane John was diabetic had fatty liver he went on nicotinic acid to measure his his blood lipids. He increased the dose after going to a non-flushing form and he wound up liver failure. Julie was a vegetarian on a high grain diet. She had GI problems. She was trying to avoid phytate and she was trying to avoid inorganic iron and synthetic vitamins in enriched flours. So she switched to breads made from refined but unenriched grains. She got depressed. She uh, never got not diagnosed with niacin deficiency. She wound up going schizophrenic and suicidal, and no one ever realized the problem was that she didn't have enough niacin in her diet. Jane's problem was she was supplementing with nicotinamide riboside, but it sapped her methyl groups, and this led to seesawing energy and seesawing mental and emotional health. And that's because niacin, when it is detoxified is detoxified by methylation with which lowers your creatine synthesis and lowers your ability to regulate your neurotransmitters properly in john's case he had a predisposition to liver to liver problems in the first place and adding the niacin gave him liver failure because he sapped the methyl groups in his liver so much that it led to much worse damage to that organ than happened in the case of Jane. Julie was depressed because NAD is converted to multiple different relatives of ADP ribose, which can be produced by breaking apart the NAD molecule, and also to something called NAADP, all of which are needed to regulate neurotransmitter release and you have an acute effect of not having enough niacin that can cause changes in your brain that when it's not that bad look like depression and when it's really bad look like schizophrenia. One of the reasons no one ever noticed that Julie was niacin deficient is because she didn't really have any skin symptoms for the most part. And that's because she didn't go outside that much and she wasn't exposed to enough light. The dermatitis of pellagra is due to sun-induced DNA damage. And NAD is used by enzymes called PARPs to repair DNA damage. So you cannot repair DNA damage when you don't have enough NAD. The psychological effects that Julie experienced was... One of the three Ds of pellagra, dementia, the sun-induced skin damage, is the second D of pellagra, dermatitis. The third D, diarrhea, is a result of not having enough NAD to support energy metabolism because NAD, even more than the FAD derived from riboflavin, is a universal component of energy metabolism that we require to extract energy from the foods that we eat. 
And it takes so much energy to maintain the integrity of the gastrointestinal tract. The GI tract is also exposed, the GI tract and the skin are also exposed to far more insults from the outside world because both of these lie at the outer surface of our body. As such, they have a lot more NAD turnover to protect themselves from all the damage that they experience. More generally, we could say that NAD is required for the metabolism of all energy. NADPH, which is made from NAD, is used for anabolic synthesis of cholesterol, neurotransmitters, fatty acids, nucleotides, for recycling of important nutrients like vitamin K and folate, and for antioxidant protection and detoxification. The ADP ribose that is made from breaking NAD down is used to repair DNA damage, to protect us from DNA damage ever occurring in the first place, to lengthen telomeres, which contributes to longevity. Most of this being done by enzymes, enzymes called PARPs and sirtuins. We can get NAD from nicotinic acid in plants, from nicotinamide in animal products, or from the tryptophan in the protein we eat. Doing so, depending on which way we get it, requires diverse nutrients such as magnesium, zinc, potassium, glutamine, vitamin B6, riboflavin, and iron, and robust levels of the cellular energy currency, ATP. No matter where we get it from, nicotinamide is ultimately the basic building block of NAD. Nicotinamide is converted to NAD in a two-step process passing through nicotine mononucleotide, or NMN, as an intermediate. The natural function of nicotinamide riboside, which is not found in the diet except trace amounts in milk, but is sold as a supplement, the natural purpose of this in the body is to act as a pressure release valve to allow you to, allow you to hold on more intermediates on the way from nicotinamide to NAD when you are trying to clear nicotinamide faster than you can synthesize NAD. Why would you want to do that? Because any nicotinamide that you don't clear to NAD must immediately be methylated and peed out into the urine. When we eat nicotinic acid, we convert what we can to nicotinamide. What we can't gets detoxified with glycine. What doesn't get detoxified with glycine is what causes the flushing response. Nicotinamide is absorbed intact. Nicotinamide riboside is absorbed intact. NMN or nicotinamide mononucleotide is almost certainly broken down to nicotinamide or nicotinamide riboside without being absorbed intact. NAD and NADPH in the food that we eat is going to be broken down into nicotinamide or maybe to nicotinamide riboside. All of these wind up going to the liver before they go anywhere else. Under normal physiology, the only thing that gets into the general circulation is nicotinamide that the liver broke down from its own store of NAD to send out into the circulation to nourish the rest of the tissues. If nicotinamide riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotide are able to nourish NAD content of tissues any better than standard forms of niacin, it's because they're better able to increase the liver store of NAD instead of getting methylated and peed out into the urine, which allows the liver to then send nicotinamide into the circulation. But those forms are not being circulated to be taken up by other tissues. Injectable NAD plus is not well studied. Extracellular NAD plus in the bloodstream can get taken up by cells, but it also provokes vasodilation and an inflammatory response and it absolutely does not play a normal role in circulating to the tissues of the body under normal physiological conditions. All right, that is our short review of the big, big podcast in episode 60. We are now moving forward where Alex, Leaf, and I will talk about blood tests, food, and supplements. Before we dive into the details, here is a word from my sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. 
Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. And vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in, and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. 
I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. Okay, so understanding the, the physiology here and what happens to these vitamins once they get in, We want to ask the question, what is a good marker of nutritional status? We want to understand this both from the perspective of how do I know if I have good niacin status? How do you know if you have good niacin status? We also want to look at it from the perspective of how do we study how much niacin humans require? Now, I want to say at the outset that this compared to riboflavin is a mess. It's just a mess. So in episode 58, we talked about riboflavin and You know, Alex and I both looked at a lot of studies that had this really clean marker of erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity that was very consistent in how it was used across the studies, very consistent in how you could make a cutoff for who's deficient, who's optimizing their enzymatic activity. And it's not like that at all for niacin. One of the reasons it's not like that goes back to the basic chemistry. Niacin in the form of NAD and in the form of NADPH is a diffusible carrier of electrons from one place to another that's not bound to any protein. Riboflavin, in the form mainly of FAD, a little bit as FMN, is a bound cofactor of enzymes that is part of the enzyme. The reason erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity was a good marker for riboflavin status was because when you make that enzyme, it's supposed to have riboflavin. If you make that enzyme without riboflavin, it's because you didn't have enough riboflavin. And you can, you can look at someone's blood and you can say, this specific enzyme, how defective is what you're making by looking at how much do you stimulate it by adding riboflavin? There's, there aren't any such enzymes that, are, that have NAD bound to them that you can measure their activity and you can add the NAD and see how much it responds. So we just, we don't, like that, that way of getting a really nice marker is not available to us for niacin. And what that means is that we're forced to look for something else. Overwhelmingly, what people have used in the literature as a marker of niacin deficiency is the methylated metabolites of niacin in the urine. And the reason is, when you don't have enough niacin, you don't excrete methylated metabolites in the urine. When you do have enough niacin, you do. Now, we need to be really, really careful here. Does the fact that you're excreting methylated metabolites in the urine mean you have as much niacin as you could possibly need for optimal health? That you have too much niacin? No, it doesn't. Because you don't, me- your, body- your liver is not sitting there and saying, cells, make me a report by Saturday of how much niacin I have, and then I will decide how much to throw in the trash on Sunday. It doesn't work like that. You don't have a very finely tuned account balance. What you have is a moment-to-moment irreversible methylation of nicotinamide on the basis that in that moment, you had more than you could convert into NAD, and in that moment, you could not risk inhibiting the NAD-using enzymes with that nicotinamide. So in that moment, you had to get rid of that molecule of niacin, right? So all it means is that we're above a certain threshold where that, where that immediate acute calculation has to start being made. So if we look, if we look at, these, um, at these studies, there's pretty good consensus that you can say that if methylated niacin metabolites are below a certain level, you are niacin deficient, you're likely over time to develop pellagra. And there's consensus that if you bring niacin up to a certain degree, you'll get rid of those methylated metabolites. The caveat to that, the limitation is that 
It doesn't tell us if you have optimum niacin status in these studies. The other limitation is that LabCorp doesn't offer this test. Quest doesn't offer this test. No one offers this test. So urinated methylated metabolites is great to describe in a textbook. It's great to publish in a research paper. It's great to bring out into a field study of a possible pellagra epidemic in some other country. But it's just useless as a clinical test in the here and now in the United States and in most other developed countries. And it, and as we'll see, um, it has a lot to, to be desired for in terms of telling us how much niacin we need for optimal health. Now, there's a second marker that has a lot of promise, and that is the erythrocyte, meaning red blood cell, NAD, or its ratio to NADPH. There was a very good depletion study where they took a bunch of people and they said, okay, we're going to put you on a nice and deficient diet. We're going to look at what happens to NAD and NADPH in your red blood cells. What happened was the NAD went down and the NADPH did not. Probably because NADPH in the red blood cell is absolutely essential for preventing hemolysis. So the red blood cell is probably hanging on to that because it's a lot more acutely important than the NAD is. And they found that pretty consistently over the course of weeks, you'll see that the NAD goes down, the NADPH doesn't. And they said, well, okay, we could look at the absolute amount of the NAD, or we could take the ratio of the NAD to the NADPH. That ratio is called the niacin number. You might have the niacin number expressed as just the ratio, in which case they'll say if you go below one, then you're at risk of niacin deficiency. Or they might, they might multiply the ratio by 100 and say, if you go below 100, you're at risk of niacin deficiency. The nice thing about taking the ratio like this is that it's probably much more um, it's, it's probably much more consistent across different laboratories. So for example, there's one laboratory that offers this commercially, HDRI. I'm not 100% confident that the absolute numbers that they're going to measure in something in your blood are going to come out to the way some other lab is measuring it that's publishing it in the literature. But based on the performance of the, of the niacin number, this ratio across multiple studies carried out by a couple different groups, that seems really consistent. It seems that very consistently, people who are on a healthy diet, who are not taking niacin supplements, have a niacin number of 175, that if you put them on a depletion diet, it will go down below 100. If you keep them on the depletion diet, it'll go down to around 60. And if you supplement them with niacin, you can get it up to 600. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that if HDRI is doing that test, they're probably going to come out with results that are very similar to what some other laboratory is using that's in the literature, uh, just because just because whatever variations there there are are going are going to be more likely to be taken to be controlled for by taking the ratio. Now there's a caveat to this test, which is that there was a 2007 paper that I'll post in the show notes where they went to Angola and they found a pellagra epidemic. And only four of the 10 people who had the characteristic dermatitis had a niacin number under 100. And if they compared the people who were coming in as newly diagnosed with pellagra to other people in that community, there was no difference in their niacin number. And when they fixed the pellagra by supplementing them with niacin, the niacin number didn't go up. And that's at remarkable contrast to uh, at least five or six other papers where the niacin number was replicated in different populations. I don't know whether this study is an outlier because of the, the laboratory methods were wrong or if there's a genetic difference in this population that makes them conserve their erythrocyte NAD or, or maybe there's a difference between acute depletion studies and chronic deficiency that's persisting over months or years. Maybe there's adaptations in your red blood cells that make it not reliable when you're looking at someone uh, who's had niacin deficiency for years. And that's why it's, it's, really, it's really important to compare acute controlled studies in a laboratory with actual field observational studies. A lot of people don't appreciate this about observational studies, that yes, there's a lot of confounders 
But it's also the case that you can never do a controlled study that lasts six years. But you can find people who have been deficient in a nutrient for five or six years. So I want to be very cautious about recommending this test as a marker of niacin status, but it remains the case that it is the only one, the only, it's the It has pretty good support in multiple studies, and it is the only commercially available test for niacin that has any support in any studies. For example, LabCorp and Quest both offer blood tests for the the vitamin forms of niacin, which has no utility for your long-term niacin status. It's reflecting what you've eaten recently. So with the caution that my confidence in this test is not 100% and won't be until I see more replication in different contexts, my current recommendation remains the same as what it was in testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, which is to use the Health Diagnostic Research Institute, HDRI, for uh, for their blood levels of NADH and NADPH a link to them in the show notes. I think you want to be around 175. And as you get below that, especially as you cross 100, that's clear evidence of niacin deficiency. We can also say that based on the study that Alex was talking about, that there is an NAD response to nicotinamide riboside. And we do, I, in that paper, they did not take the niacin number. So we don't, we don't have that. But the principle that better niacin status means your red blood cells have more NAD in them, that principle seems pretty sound. So I think what we're ultimately going to do is we're going to have to look at what are actual health outcomes of taking, whether, it's, whether it is nicotinamide the, or the fancy pants, nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside, what are the health outcomes? And can we develop a biomarker of those health outcomes? Because it may be the case that if we can develop a biomarker of those health outcomes, erythrocyte NAD levels are probably going to be front and center in the development of, of you know, in the competition as being one of those markers. And, and we just probably will not be able to use methylated um, methylated niacin metabolites to test the positive health outcomes. Because imagine it like this. I said before that nicotinamide is going to spill into that pathway faster than nicotinamide riboside. Nicotinamide riboside is going to elevate NAD more than it's going to spill into that pathway. They'll both do both. But if you see, like, let's say you did a study and you looked at methylated um, niacin metabolites. Well, you're probably going to see a, a better increase in the methylated metabolites in the urine on the forms of niacin that generate less NAD. So the health, the health outcomes, if anything, at niacin intakes above the RDA are probably going to be inversely correlated with methylated metabolites because the degree to which those increase just reflect the degree to which you are not effectively utilizing the niacin for the synthesis of NAD. And the leading reason to use a fancy pants supplement like nicotinamide riboside is because presumably you get a better NAD response. So I think that right now, we can use that marker in the conventional sense of wanting to be at 175, not wanting to go below 100, but we're going to have to look out for research studies to better define what what is the biomarker response we can get to correlate with the positive health outcomes? You know, once we show that they exist, we'll talk about how much evidence there is for the, their existence later with Alex. All right, so ha- having that mar- having th- these markers, how do we know how much niacin we need? This is another area where it's just embarrassingly messy compared to riboflavin. We concluded in episode 58 that we need more riboflavin than what the RDA thought, but the RDA was based on on a pretty good number of fairly elegant studies using a very good biomarker. By contrast, um, you know, part of the reason the RDA for niacin is so sloppy is because the data is just so messy for the reasons I was describing before, but it's also just, it's like in some of the reasoning involved is is just a little bit embarrassing 
to read and talk about. So, so, so listen to this. Okay. The DR, the RDA for niacin is based on four studies where they looked at the excretion of methylated metabolites in the urine. Two of these studies were done in men. Two of them were done in women. These studies were looking at niacin equivalents. So quite often they were looking at tryptophan supplementation. But, but they, and often they were also comparing it to um, nicotinamide supplementation. If you take the average of all four studies done in two done in men, two done in women, you come up with eleven point six milligrams per day, or four point eight milligrams for every thousand calories needed to get a to get methylated niacin metabolites into the urine over and above what you would expect to be at risk for pellagra. But if you look at the two female studies, they showed requirements of 12.6 milligrams per day and 10.9 milligrams per day. If you look at the two male studies, they were very consistently around 11.5, 11.3 in one study, 11.5 in one study. So one of the female studies was a little bit under the male studies. The other one was a couple mil, was, um, over a milligram higher than the male studies. In the the report to make the RDA, they said that if you look at the data in that table, it looks like maybe females need more niacin than males. Oh, I should have mentioned this. When you adjust per per calorie, the women had requirements of 5.8 and 6.8, which was which did not overlap at all with the requirement of the males. The males required 4.4 and 4.9, right? So the females clearly require, in from those two studies, more niacin per energy intake than the men. So they looked at these studies and they said, even though it looks like women need more niacin than men, the data just are not rigorous comparisons of men and women. And that's true. The data aren't good for comparing men and women because it's four different studies with four different methodologies, with four different sample sizes, with four different all kinds of conditions, two of them done in women, two of them done in men. That's not good basis for comparing men and women. But then they said that because the data that make it look like women need more than men are not good data, we will assume that women have a slightly lower requirement than men do because of their size and average energy utilization. So I get that it's not good data to say that women need more than men, but bad data, but like data that isn't good, rigorous male female comparison is better than your assumption that the opposite of the data is true. Furthermore, in that report, they discuss the physiology by which estrogen increases the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. Why would estrogen do that unless women needed more niacin than men do? Now, you know, maybe you could say that if women have enough protein in their diet and they're getting enough tryptophan, because estrogen increases the conversion of tryptophan to estrogen, then those women need less preformed niacin in their diet. But that's not what the RDA is about. The RDA is about niacin equivalence. The RDA says that one milligram of niacin is equal to 60 milligrams of tryptophan. And what's the total of niacin equivalence that you need? So based on the physiology in order to take advantage of the fact that women convert tryptophan to to niacin at a higher rate because of their estrogen, they have to have enough niacin equivalents in the form of tryptophan, in the form of protein in their diet. So the physiology and the data in the report both make it look like women need more niacin per unit energy than men do. And the RDA said that we assume, I quote, we we quote, assumed that women have a slightly lower requirement than do men because of their size and their average energy utilization, unquote. They assumed it in direct contrast to the data in their table and to the physiology that they described around estrogen. So as a result of this assumption, the estimated average requirement for men is 12 milligrams per day, per day, 
And for women, it's 11 milligrams per day. Then they go, then they go on to say, now, now they, once they say the average, they have to say, let's assess the variation. Because the RDA is not meant to apply to you or to me or to any individual. It's meant to apply to a population. The RDA says, what's the average requirement? And then what is the variation around that average requirement? How can we capture the average and the variation to make a recommendation that will cover the needs of 97 to 98% of the people? In most RDAs, what they do is they say, we don't have data about what the variation is, so we're going to assume it's 10%. In the case of niacin, they had four studies in their table that all estimated the variation, all give a specific number for the variation. Those four studies suggested that the variation was 8%, that one standard deviation, so, you know, like the population is the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So standard deviation was estimated in women as 8% in one study, 23% in the second study. In men, it was estimated as 39% in one study and 41% in the second study. That suggests two things. One, that the variation is way higher than 10% for everyone. And two, that it's less variable for women than it is for men. Why would it be less variable for women than for men? Perhaps because estrogen regulates the synthesis of niacin from tryptophan. So perhaps in men, it's not regulated, and in women, it is. And that means that women have a higher need for total niacin, they have a better conversion of tryptophan to niacin that makes them better able to use protein for that purpose. And their needs can be quantified with less variation because it's so regulated in them. Okay, did they do that? No. They said, if the data in the table say that the, that the standard deviation is somewhere between 8% and 41%, then it's clearly more than 10%. So we'll call it 15%. So the RDA is set by the average requirement plus two standard deviations. And that means plus 30%. But the data in the men suggested that it was 39 or 41% variation. If they used the data, the requirement for the men would be the average plus 80% not plus 30%. So the, the end result of this is that the RDA for, um, for men is 16 milligrams. The RDA for women is 14 milligrams. Had they used a, um, had they used a de- the amount of variation in those studies, they would have put it closer to 20 milligrams per day for men and 22 milligrams per day for women. Had they, had they looked at the average requirement and the average variation separately in men and women, then they would have said that women require about 16 milligrams and men require about 21 milligrams. So these data suggest that we need to add at least a few milligrams of niacin to the requirement on top of what the RDA is. For women in pregnancy, they add four milligrams to the RDA, bringing it up to 18 milligrams. And that's based on uh, how much extra energy you expend during pregnancy. For lactating mothers, they added uh, three milligrams, bringing the RDA up to 17 milligrams. That's based on the amount of niacin that goes into the milk and an assumption about the energy cost to make the milk. For infants under six months old, it's estimated by by the amount of niacin that's in the milk that they consume. And then for everyone else after six months old, the requirement is adjusted down based on body weight. It's my personal opinion that a growing, that like someone in an adolescent growth spurt probably has a niacin requirement that is more proportional to their energy intake than their body weight. And I have no direct data to back that up, but my preference would be to assume that because there's no harm in consuming a little bit extra niacin as not as food niacin. So in, 
So after I talk about different food sources and endogenous synthesis, I'll, I'll come back to my recommendation. But my idea of what I would do with the data in the RDA is to say that the requirement for everyone should be somewhere around 20 milligrams of preformed food-based niacin plus adequate protein in your diet. And for children, adjust it downward based on calorie intake. And, you know, not because I have the data, but because if you have an adolescent going through a growth spurt, I think it's a lot safer to just assume that the amount of food that they're eating should be made up of the same niacin-rich foods as an adult would be eating to match their growth spurt than to just assume that body weight is an adequate adjustment downward. Like why, why eat a lower amount of niacin per, per unit of food consumed because you're a growing child? It just doesn't make sense. All right, so how would we achieve this then? How would we get enough niacin? Well, in theory, the requirement for preformed niacin declines for every one milligram, by, oh, excuse me, declines by one milligram for every 60 milligrams of tryptophan in your diet. If you just assume that you're eating a mixed diet with mixed proteins, then that means that if you're eating 50 grams of protein per day, you're going to get nine milligrams of niacin. If you eat 100 grams of protein a day, you're going to get 19 milligrams of niacin. If you eat 150 grams of protein a day, like I do, you're going to get 20 milligrams of niacin. If you eat 200 grams per day, you're going to get 38 milligrams of niacin. So just eating enough protein is going to put you close to or over the RDA. There's a problem with this assumption. First of all, we know that this pathway of synthesis does not kick in until you have met your needs for protein synthesis with tryptophan. In other words, if you're on a protein deficient diet, you're you're not uh and like and you're going to the gym and you're working out, like there's no tryptophan going into this pathway. You're scavenging whatever you can to build your muscles up. It's when you have that excess that this spills over into the pathway. Now, some people back when most of this stuff was quantified suggested that you needed 150 milligrams of tryptophan for that basal requirement. In the DRI for protein, the R, the which is the report for the that makes the RDAs, they suggest we need five milligrams per kilogram body weight tryptophan. That would be 350 milligrams of tryptophan for someone who weighs 150 pounds or 70 kilograms. That would suggest that all the values that I cited at the beginning, that we actually have to take somewhere between two and a half to six milligrams of niacin off that. So that, that suggests that if we're consuming 100 grams of protein in diet, we're not getting 19, we're getting somewhere around 13 or 14 milligrams of niacin from it. Just on that basis, I would say that that suggests that you want 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight to ensure niacin status. And that, that basically what we're saying here is you know, one to two grams of protein per kilogram body weight or a half a gram to one gram of protein per pound of body weight to fulfill your niacin requirement. But <laughs> there's another caveat to this. First of all, there's genetic and other variations that are poorly characterized that determine how much niacin you can produce from tryptophan. We know, for example, estrogen regulates it. So in women, it's going to be better than men, but in women, it's going to vary with their cycle. And in women, it's going to vary with, from woman to woman with their estrogen levels and from their, uh, and through the course of development, whether you're, uh, what stage of development are you? Are you a child? Are you in fertility age? Are you, do you have amenorrhea? Do you, are you on birth control? Are you postmenopausal? All of those things are going to affect the, the uh, trip, are going to affect the ability to get niacin from tryptophan. Genetics, who knows, poorly characterized, but we know very, various people are different. Furthermore, there's not really good evidence that we even regulate this for the purpose of niacin. I suspect that that's what estrogen is doing in women, but let's take the example of men. There's no evidence in men that we regulate the conversion of tryptophan to niacin by anything that has anything to do with our niacin status. In men in particular, there's it seems to be the case that this is just a backup valve for the for clearing excess tryptophan. And there's two reasons to think that. One reason is if you look at the pathway that this goes through, most of those nine steps just get you down to the point where 
you you get to the point where you could take this intermediate, you could completely oxidize it for fuel, or you could make niacin, and over well over 90% of it, you just completely oxidize for fuel. So this is mainly a way to get rid of tryptophan, not to make niacin. But then, you know, if you choose to make niacin, what happens? Well, first you make quinolinate. Quinolinate is neurotoxic. And converting it to niacin minimizes its neurotoxicity. In men, probably the regulation of this pathway is that when you have too much tryptophan, you start going down the pathway. If you have the capacity to completely oxidize it, you do. If you don't, you make some quinolinate. If you make quinolinate, you do your damnedest to get rid of it because it's neurotoxic and you do that by making niacin. And so in that case, it seems very unwise to assume that you will have good niacin status just from getting protein. Doing that is like, it's like assuming that red, orange, yellow, and green vegetables are going to give you all the vitamin A you need. You should have some retinol in your diet, and you sh- but you should still get those vegetables. So you should still get your protein. Right, Alex? Real quick, like, Alex, what do you think protein requirements per day are, like, forgetting about tryptophan and niacin? So that's definitely going to depend on your goals, health status, and physical activity levels. Evidence is pretty clear that regardless of any of that outside of kidney disease, 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day is like the absolute minimum. Uh, And that's based on indicator amino acid oxidation studies that uh, don't give the body time to downregulate important uh, biosynthetic processes in response to protein restriction that afflicts a lot of the nitrogen balance studies used when determining the RDA. Uh, for athletes, it's going to be about 1.6 grams per kilogram as a minimum, and then going all the way up to 3.3 grams per kilogram or one and a half grams per pound of body weight, depending on how active they are and how many calories they're eating. Now, in you know, in those higher requirements, what what are they doing with the extra protein? Are they is that for anabolic synthesis of muscle protein? Is it to break down for energy? Like what if we can summarize in one or two sentences, what's the primary use of the extra protein going into the athlete? So that's a really good question, actually. And I don't think that we have an answer for that. All we have is speculation. I mean, no one has like, for example, isotopically labeled all the amino acids that some that an athlete would eat in a day and then see what happens. Uh, what we can say is that most of that extra protein is going to go into promoting muscle protein synthesis and actually being incorporated directly into that muscle tissue to increase muscle mass. That's uh, what will happen over time. And it's probably also going to go into boosting immune function and supporting other aspects of whole body protein turnover, uh, like collagen synthesis. But it is completely possible, too, that you're just going to be giving a lot more protein to the gut, for example. And it's not going to play a big role in any major biosynthetic pathways outside of just supporting general gut health. So uh, you know, one so there's one thing that's that is very relevant here is that there are so many potential uses of that extra protein that Alex just laid out that you can't assume that any of it is going to the liver to synthesize niacin from tryptophan. Like it might, but you know, the athlete might need more niacin just on the basis of blasting through so much extra energy expenditure and on the basis of doing, putting so much stress on their body that requires repair processes. Because remember, all these stressful events are even just going out into the sun is causing DNA damage that you're consuming NAD to fix. And so all the oxidative stress from being an athlete is going to consume NAD in those processes and increase your requirement. Is that extra protein giving you any extra niacin? Who knows? Because it's what we do know is that probably... Probably if you keep protein constant and you go from being sedentary to going to the gym to work out, you are now diverting protein into building muscle. And now 
you probably have a higher requirement for not preformed niacin in food simply because you took the same pool of protein and now you're shifting it into muscle growth. And that makes, means less tryptophan is available to the liver for synthesis of niacin. So this is, I mean, this should, the other, you know, the other point is that what Alex is saying is the minimum protein requirement is roughly like the bottom of that corresponds to what I would suggest you should eat protein just to make sure you're you're hitting the niacin bases, right? So it's it doesn't if niacin were irrelevant, you should still eat that amount of protein. You hope some of it goes into your niacin, but you don't assume any of it does. So dietary niacin, what are our main concerns? Well, niacin in the diet, and I'm talking about nicotinic acid mainly found in plants and nicotinamide mainly found in animal products. Niacin, it, unlike riboflavin, it's very stable to heat, very stable to light, very stable to, to dry storage. But there are a number of concerns about processing. And these concerns are not that processing hurts your niacin. It's that processing is needed to get niacin from a lot of plant foods. So 85 to 90% of the niacin in grains is not bioavailable. 40% of the niacin in seeds is not bioavailable. All of the niacin in pulses, in yeast, and in animal products is available. Why, you know, what's the relevance? Why do we even know this? It's because the pellagra epidemics were overwhelmingly associated with the consumption of corn. Why? Well, two things. Corn is low in protein, so you're not getting much tryptophan. But also, when, as I mentioned before, when Columbus brought corn from Central America and spread it throughout what is now the United, eventually the United States and through Europe, he took the corn and didn't take the traditional processing. The traditional processing of corn is called nixtamalization, which means soaking the corn in an alkali solution. This completely frees the bound niacin. While that is well known, what is not well known is that other forms of processing are also relevant. So a recent study showed that if you ferment the grain for eight hours, you increase the free of bioavailable niacin eightfold. If you ferment it after you've sprouted it for three days, then you increase the bioavailable niacin tenfold. Sprouting on its own does not do much. So fermentation is the main thing over eight hours. Sprouting is the minor thing. It's best to do both. By contrast, the process of making bread out of whole wheat flour takes the bound unavailable niacin in the wheat flour from its original 80% to 60%. In other words, you're only freeing 25% of the bound niacin. Why? Because making bread from using yeast is a shorter fermentation time. So fermentation in general is good at freeing up the niacin. It's just that with the short rise modern yeast, you don't get as much time to free up the niacin as you do from the traditional processes. So again, the two ways you free niacin in grains and seeds is fermentation and alkali solution. So there was a study actually with wheat that, show, that showed that if you add in enough baking soda when you make scones, you can actually free all of the niacin simply because the extra baking soda provides the alkali solution that frees the niacin just like the traditional process of treating corn with alkali in the process of making tortillas. In coffee, the niacin in coffee is the detoxification product that we make. One methyl or actually, it's, it's almost, instead of nicotinamide that we make, it's one methyl nicotinic acid, nicotinic acid being the plant form. In order to free the niacin in coffee, you have to roast it. But your light roast is not very good at freeing the niacin in coffee. If you dark roast coffee, you free twice as much niacin as if you light roast it. And if you Italian roast it, meaning heavy roast it, meaning darker than French roast, you triple the amount of niacin that gets freed up. Then when you brew the coffee, you extract 85% of whatever you of whatever you freed during the roasting process. In addition to that, it makes a difference how strong your coffee is. If you like weak coffee, then you have less niacin because there's less coffee in your coffee and there's more water in your coffee. Unlike, unlike riboflavin, nutritional yeast actually has a lot of niacin in it. 
if you the typical nutritional yeast that you would buy has a bunch of synthetic vitamins added to it, but unfortified traditional nutritional yeast has a significant amount of niacin, enough where three table three heaping tablespoons would give you the RDA for niacin. All right, so what are the foods that are the best sources of niacin? I'm going to break this down into five tiers. Tier one is foods that you can eat where you get the RDA in one serving. Tier two is foods that eating around two servings per day will give you the RDA. Tier three is foods that will give you the RDA in three to five servings. Tier four are foods where you can bulk up on them and they don't really hurt your niacin status, but they don't do a lot to nourish it either. And tier five is the stuff where they can really displace the niacin in your diet and be a problem. So tier one, what will give you the RDA for niacin in one serving? Fresh yellowfin or shipjack tuna, but not canned tuna and not bluefin tuna. Anchovies. The livers of beef, lamb, and pork, but not the livers of poultry. Nutritional yeast in the size of three heaping tablespoons. Those are the foods where you can get the RDA for niacin in one serving. The tier two foods are the foods where you have to get about two servings to make sure you get the RDA. And these, by the way, I have adjusted for bioavailability based on what I told you before. So, Two servings of any of the following foods will give you the RDA. Peanuts and peanut butter. And when I say serving, unless I otherwise, uh, unless I explain otherwise, I mean 100 grams or three and a half ounces. So I'm not saying like spread a little bit of peanut butter on your bread and you have the RDA for niacin. I'm saying consume three or four ounces of peanuts or peanut butter and you have the RDA for niacin. The livers of veal, chicken, and turkey. Most fresh meat products from typical farm animals and typical game animals, if they are lean cuts or fairly lean cuts. I'm not saying you can't eat fatty meat, but the fat has no niacin. Certain fish, these include canned or fresh uh, canned tuna or fresh bluefin tuna, most salmon, mackerel, yellowfin, halibut, American shad, sturgeon, cod, mahi-mahi, and bluefish. Certain seeds, namely hemp, chia, and sunflower. Eating any of these foods gives you the RDA in two servings. Tier three gives you the RDA in three to five servings. Most other fin fish that I didn't mention in tier two, but not shellfish. Sesame seeds and tahini, pumpkin and squash seeds, pine nuts, almonds, chestnuts, flax seeds, peas. Cuts of meat that are not muscle or liver, for example, heart or tongue, Or cuts of meat that are fattier, simply because the fat takes up room in the diet that doesn't have any niacin. Many mushrooms, namely white, portobello, shiitake, oyster, and criminy. And coffee, if the coffee is Italian roast, which is darker than dark roast, and if you use 10 grams of of coffee per cup, a cup of coffee will be in tier three. Those give you the RDA in three to five servings. Tier four are foods where bulking up on these don't really hurt your niacin status because they do give their they do give niacin. But like none of these really are. You wouldn't look at these and say, "I want to eat a lot of this because I'll have a lot of niacin." So these are just foods that it's okay to bulk up on without really hurting your status. These include most beans most crustaceans, processed meats like deli meats, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, kale, cabbage, and coffee that is French roast or dark roast at the top, giving you about two milligrams of niacin, and then light roast at the bottom, giving you one milligram of niacin. Again, 10 grams of coffee per cup. If you drink it weaker than that, you get less niacin. So those foods feel free to stock up on them without hurting your status. Tier five are are foods that might have some niacin, but like the more you eat them, the more you eat less of the other foods and you're really hurting your niacin if you bulk up on these. These include foods that are mostly fat. I'm not saying you can't eat keto, but if you eat keto, you got to eat a lot from tier one. Foods that are mostly sugar. 
Refined flours that are not enriched. Remember, flour by law is enriched in niacin since the 1940s, but you can, if you go out of your way, find flour that's not enriched. We could say, in addition to these five tiers, we could say fat, sugar, and unenriched refined flours are the most displacing out of all foods. We could also say that most enriched flours are either in tier two or tier three. I don't recommend re- consuming enriched white flour because it's junk food, but it goes in tier two or tier three. It does contribute to your niacin status. Traditionally processed whole grains, like corn that's been nixtamalized or from, or properly fermented, eight-hour fermented, sprouted whole wheat. Pro, traditionally processed whole grains are generally going to occupy tier four, meaning you can eat a, a lot of it. It's not going to hurt your niacin status as long as you don't eat it at the expense of foods in the higher tiers. And then one last point, and Alex, I want to tie you in, in on this a little bit, is that there are some foods that are very rich in, in niacin that I think are probably irrelevant to almost everyone. And these are mainly herbs and spices. So if you look at Foods like dried spirulina, chili powder, coriander, coriander, paprika, parsley, ginger, tarragon, red or cayenne pepper. All of these would occupy tier two if anyone consumed 100 grams of them. And so like <laughs> we know that like most people are not eating 100 grams of any of this stuff. But Alex, I know you look, did a lot of research on spirulina. Is there any context in the world where a population might consume 100 grams of dried spirulina on a daily basis on average? Well, I think that an argument could be made, uh, just generally speaking, that all of those spices could be consumed when you combine them all together in a 100 gram per day or possibly more uh, through... Uh, I, in certain people who just like to load up on spices, I know that I'm one of them. Um, my, uh, particularly favorite one is cinnamon and it's not a good source of niacin, but just as a point in case, I personally eat, you know, 20 to 25 grams of cinnamon per day, just because I love how it tastes on a lot of the foods that I use. And I really load it on. Now, if you combine that with, for example, the loads of chili powder that I put, uh, into like tuna, if I were to make tuna and the mustard seed that goes into all of the mustard I use in condiments, you know, it, it's, it's logical to think that someone could get a small dose on a daily basis. But again, if these are going to occupy tier four and simply provide, you know, several milligrams per hundred gram serving, then these are, these are actually tier two with the, the one exception that the seeds, so like like mustard seeds, for example, or actually any of the seeds, you have to cut the bioavailability by, um, by to say it's sixty percent bioavailable. So m- maybe some of them are tier three, but they're like two, tier two or tier three. So they're fairly decent if you combine that specific list to a total of a hundred grams. So so like okay, like if you really love your spices, you might do that. Uh, what about the spirulina? I know you talked about you did some research on the traditional use of it. Yeah, so spirulina was actually uh, first discovered in Africa. Uh, the native tribes surrounding the re- in the Republic of Chad re- region um, around Lakes Chad and Lake Niger of Central Africa, they have spirulina be a major a source of protein in their diet where they eat, uh, they would easily exceed 100 grams per day. Um, they will collect it and let it dry on the bays and then uh, pat it together down into little cakes called D. Um, and Central America is also another place. The Aztecs uh, were have been documented to trade spirulina with the Spanish when they first entered into the Central America region to conquer them. So, I mean, historically, spirulina w- would have been a really good source. Yeah, so that's that's pretty cool. All right, so these food sources, um, you know, that's a like listing a lot of stuff. So these will be in the show notes. And since this is episode 60, you can get the show notes at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 60, or just click through uh, through the description of wherever you're, you're watching this or listening to this. Um, okay, so 
source is in the colon. We know that intestinal bacteria can synthesize niacin. As Alex mentioned before, int intestinal bacteria can also degrade certain forms of niacin into the more base products. Um, but there are many microorganisms that cannot make niacin that are dependent on, my, on, on niacin. Even in the rumen of a ruminant, there are a huge portion of that ecology cannot make niacin and is it dependent on niacin consumed in the food. And in general, when you look, like if you were to quantify the niacin input into the environment, our ecosystem, it's mainly plants that introduce niacin through de novo synthesis. So it's just, and also niacin has just not been researched anywhere near as much as riboflavin, it seems to me, in terms of like how these little details affect the requirement. Um, and so I, I, I don't, I haven't found anything about what, like quantifying what, if anything, the contribution of the microbiome to niacin status is. All right. So why would we expect to find niacin deficiency somewhere? Well, globally, there's not a lot of outbreaks of plagra anymore, but there are some. But in the United States and in developed countries, we are not expecting to see any particular population with pellagra. We are expecting to see rare cases of this severe deficiency popping up in certain highly vulnerable subsets of the population. So where we see it now, or where we saw it historically, was mainly associated with low-protein diets that were based on unprocessed corn. And those diets are not just not very common in the world anymore. In our neck of the woods, we might accept, expect to see severe niacin deficiency in the following conditions. Hartnup's disease is a rare genetic disorder of tryptophan malabsorption. If you don't absorb the tryptophan, you can't make niacin from it. And you would, for that reason, become more fully dependent on preformed niacin in the diet. There are conceivably any malabsorption disorder that's going to affect the upper small intestine is going to have the potential of causing niacin deficiency. But the case reports are published with Crohn's disease, as well as a rare condition called megaduodenum, which is a an inherited disorder that causes hypertrophy of part of the small intestine, and that can cause malabsorption. There are also serotonin-producing tumors known as carcinoid tumors, and these divert tryptophan into serotonin synthesis. The more tryptophan is diverted into serotonin synthesis, the more it is directed away from niacin synthesis. Now, you could generalize from that, and you could say, well, I don't have a carcinoid tumor, but maybe I'm diverting tryptophan uh, into serotonin synthesis and away from niacin, and that might make me relatively more dependent on preformed niacin. So we could generalize from those tumors and we could say, well, stress might be increasing your serotonin production, or you might deliberately be making efforts to get carbohydrate, or excuse me, to get tryptophan into the brain. So for example, I've made several episodes on getting tryptophan into the brain by taking either to either taking tryptophan on an empty stomach away from other protein, which would provide you additional tryptophan to get into the brain. So that probably wouldn't be directing the tryptophan in your protein away from niacin synthesis. But I've also talked about using carbohydrate. And if you take carbohydrate with your protein, the carbohydrate drives cells that excuse me, drives amino acids that would otherwise compete with tryptophan entry into the brain, drives those competing amino acids into the muscle cells. By doing that, it makes the tryptophan better able to cross the blood-brain barrier and get in there to make serotonin and melatonin. But whatever tryptophan gets into the brain is tryptophan that's being directed away from niacin synthesis. And so in a way that's analogous to the carcinoid tumors, but to a lesser degree, any of those efforts to get tryptophan into the brain better could could make you more reliant on dietary preformed niacin. There are drugs that impair the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. These include isoniazid, which is used to treat tuberculosis, imuran and 6-mercaptopurine, which are immunosuppressives, 5-fluorouracil, which is an anti-cancer drug, levodopa and carbidopa, which are Parkinson's drugs, and alcohol. As a result of that latter drug, alcohol, alcoholism 
is associated both with poor intake of niacin and many other nutrients. And just like alcohol impairs the metabolic activation of many other nutrients, it impairs conversion of tryptophan to niacin. And so you get this double whammy with alcoholism where you're not eating well and you're not producing niacin through endogenous synthesis well either. HIV and AIDS is associated with poor niacin status. In this case, it's probably because the disease state is causing oxidative stress and cellular damage that is causing you to use up NAD to engage in the repair processes that we had talked about earlier. And you could reason from that. You could generalize from that and say, really anyone with a lot of stress and cellular damage is going to is going to plow through NAD at a much faster rate and have higher requirements for niacin. Deficiencies of iron, riboflavin, and vitamin B6 impair the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. So def- deficiencies of any of those nutrients could make you more vulnerable to deficiency. And as we're moving into the following, we're moving kind of towards what would make you not have risk of pellagra, but at least make you more likely to have suboptimal niacin status. We could say a diet that's based on unprocessed whole grains. This is, you know, fairly common. Uh, If you're, and this is one of the ironies of being health conscious. So if you're not health conscious, you probably have fairly reasonable niacin status because if you eat, Say, yeah, if you eat hamburgers and white flour buns, your white flour buns have niacin added to them. Your burgers, a a pretty decent source of niacin. It's a pretty decent source of tryptophan. If you're eating a bunch of meat and you're eating a bunch of white bread, probably your niacin is okay. But if you're avoiding a lot of the meats that are high in niacin and then you're shifting from, from enriched, refined grains to whole grains... Remember the the niacin in, in wheat bread. Take for example whole wheat bread. The niacin in wheat bread is not that high, and it's also eighty percent unavailable in the unprocessed wheat grain, and it's about sixty percent available when you've made a traditional yeast bread from it. So even what niacin is there is not very bioavailable. And if you're relying on other whole grains, you know you're back to the the epidemics of pellagra that resulted from unprocessed corn tortillas. A diet that's based on sugar and fat. No, I'm not demonizing fat by lumping it in with sugar. I'm not saying you can't eat fat, but sugar doesn't have any niacin in it and fat doesn't have any niacin in it because niacin is water soluble. So even if you're talking about meats, you don't have to eat lean meat. You can eat fatty meat, but you're getting the niacin from the lean portion of the meat. So the leaner your meat, the more niacin you're getting from it. The higher your diet in fat, the more the lower the niacin is, and the more reliant you become on eating those very top tier foods that are very rich in niacin to compensate for all the volume you took up in your diet with all the fat. A diet very low in non-collagen protein. This is a, a point that we should hammer in here. When we talked about protein requirements, Collagen doesn't fulfill those requirements because collagen doesn't have any tryptophan. In fact, collagen is often used in tryptophan depletion studies, not because collagen depletes you in tryptophan as much as collagen doesn't have any tryptophan. So don't go around thinking that if you put 15 grams of collagen in your smoothie, you got 15 grams of protein. The When you talk about your protein requirement, we're talking about the non-collagen protein that is rich in essential amino acids that includes tryptophan. So as I said before, any form of cellular damage, that could be normal sunlight exposure on one end, and then on the other extreme, severe injuries, disease states, the stress that inevitably comes with aging, these all deplete NAD for repair processes. Low ATP levels favor the breakdown of nicotinamide mononucleotide to nicotinamide. Remember when we were talking about the degradation pathway that we need ATP to salvage nicotinamide and make it go up to NMN or NR and then eventually from NMN to NAD. If we don't have ATP, it kind of falls back the other way. In fact, if your ATP levels are low enough, you can 
you can actually have NMN turning into nicotinamide. You can, the thing can go backwards so that you slip back to that nicotinamide. Remember, nicotinamide is the thing that you don't want around and you detoxify it. So if you have low ATP levels, you could be less able to harness the niacin in your food because you're less good at converting it to NAD. And on top of that, you can have more losses than you'd usually have by favoring the detoxification and urination of the niacin instead of its utilization. So when I think of low ATP levels, I think of disease states like diabetes. I think of things that impact your energy metabolism. You do lower, you know, the normal thing is to cycle between low ATP levels in the, in the fasted state and in the exercise state, and then high ATP levels in the rested fed state. And if you're not eating enough food and you don't get any rest, that could possibly play in there. I want to, I want to come in here real quick too, because uh, just as kind of a thought experiment, another thing that could cause low ATP levels that is currently really popular among the health circles is metformin supplementation. And also berberin supplementation. Both of these, uh, metformin and berberin, both impair complex one in the respiratory chain in mitochondria and inhibit its ability to create ATP. And that's one of the reasons they're seen as promoting mitochondrial biogenesis, giving a hormetic stress response, and being beneficial for aging. But if you are taking these drugs then it stands to reason that it could potentially impair your niacin status if you're not on top of your niacin intake as well. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it does. And so I'm 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 pretty bearish on metformin outside of the diabetic context. I think that it's a cheap imitation of fasting and I'll have to go into this in a completely different podcast. I don't think it actually replicates the fasting state, but the way it represents part of the fasting state is to lower ATP levels. And that's that's exactly what you're you're trying to leverage when you do that. So I, I like I said before, I you, you know, we're supposed to cycle between the fast state and the fed state. There's nothing wrong with that. I think the thing is if if you're using something like that in a way that is affecting your metabolism chronically, if I were to to use metformin and I wouldn't use metformin. But if I were to use metformin, I would try to target the dose so that it was only have its in, having its impact in the fasting state. And I might combine that with intermittent fasting so that I can get a, a more of a peak fasting state and then, and then get more of a peak fed state later. And that's when I'm going to eat my niacin. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think if you're chronically depleting your ATP levels, then you don't have any opportunity of where that niacin is going to fit in, where you can get that niacin in in a way that that is directed towards activation to NAD and therefore retention in the body. And um, I, you know, I think about when you usually take niacin. If you're not supplementing, you always get niacin from your food, mm-hmm. and when you eat, you're in the high in the high ATP fed state. This is very similar to what we were talking about in episode 58 with riboflavin, where it's retention in the body is all predicated on having high ATP levels that will secure it. So there's also an effect of leucine. And this is somewhat controversial because there are different studies that came to conflicting results of, about how important it was. But leucine is one of the branch chain amino acids that is responsible for signaling properties that divert your amino acids towards muscle growth. And anything that diverts your amino acids towards muscle growth diverts the tryptophan away from niacin synthesis. So you can think about this both from the perspective of eating a diet that's disproportionately rich in BCAAs or supplementing with BCAAs or supplementing with leucine or supplementing with, um, what's the name of the leucine metabolite? Do you remember off the top of your head? HMB. Yeah, the, the HMB, which is a, a leucine metabolite that is actually carrying the signaling properties, right? So any of these things that are designed to, to drive your protein into muscle synthesis are driving it away from niacin synthesis. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with muscular growth. It just means that all of a sudden you 
relative to everyone else who's not doing that, need to be more conscious of your niacin status. Yeah, on that note of muscle growth too, uh, kind of getting back to the fasted and fed state, it's important to realize that muscle growth itself is a very energy intensive process. Uh, like I re remember reading somewhere that it takes an additional 300 to 500 calories above maintenance requirements to supply the ATP necessary to actually lay down and make new muscle tissue. So in the context of our discussion here, uh, it would be logical to presume that if your goal is to build muscle, that your niacin requirements might be higher than otherwise because you're not only going to be taking ATP away from the synthesis of niacin, but more of its precursors like tryptophan would go towards actual muscle protein rather than to niacin formation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, these, none of these things really mean that, um, that, you know, any, none of these things are necessarily bad. These are all things that are where we're highlighting things that, um, m make you need to be more conscious of your niacin requirement. You know, on that note, we can transition, segue into what's the prevalence of niacin deficiency? Because there's really no indication that anyone in the United States besides those highly vulnerable populations that I mentioned earlier, um, in the general population, you'd never get the impression that we need more niacin. If you look at mean intakes of niacin in the United States, 25 milligrams, way above, um, way, you know, way above the RDA and, and only l less than 1% consume less than the average requirement, less than 10% consume less than the RDA. So there's no evidence of widespread niacin deficiency, but there's a few things that we should keep in mind when we're looking at this data. Number one, Bioavailability is not taken into account in any of the estimations of what people are eating. That's particularly a problem for the seeds and whole grains because of the poor bioavail bioavailability in those foods. In addition, the RDA itself is, by my estimation, not quite where it should be. So, Based on everything that we talked about before, my own recommendation looking at this data would be that the average person wants to consume adequate protein, by which I mean one to two grams per kilogram body weight or half a gram to a gram per pound of body weight, putting aside concerns, athletic concerns for consuming more protein. And I would try to get 20 milligrams of preformed niacin per day. But even by those metrics, still, the average person in the United States is is hitting those targets and not a very big subpopulation is consuming less than that. So, you know, maybe the bottom 20% aren't meeting that. But there are still some extra caveats that are hard to address. So in episode 58, when we talked about riboflavin, it would look the same way. Most people were getting what seemed to be enough riboflavin. But we argued that there was evidence of widespread riboflavin deficiency because we had population level estimates of widespread uh, biochemical evidence of riboflavin deficiency with the erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity coefficient, the marker that we were using in that episode. In the case of niacin, the methylated metabolites are a pretty good marker to separate out deficiency. But like I said before, they're not evidence of optimal status. But furthermore, they're actually really, it's actually really hard to measure methylated metabolites of niacin in the urine compared to measuring uh, erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity. It's more labor intensive. And so there just aren't population studies of it. It's used in the field. It's used in highly academic settings to try to determine the niacin requirement, but there's no population level studies using biochemical indices of niacin adequacy. And then on top of this, I would say that probably in our population, we are not likely to see many people whose primary problem is not consuming enough niacin in the diet. I think we're a lot more likely to see at the population level at the widespread level, 
declines in NAD due to aging and the common degenerative diseases that we experience, the leading killers. I think these things are depleting levels of NAD and increasing the amount of niacin that we would need in order to try to optimize protection against those degenerative diseases and to try to age as gracefully as we can. On the flip side of this, we can look at contributors to toxicity. So people are more vulnerable to toxic effects of high-dose nicotinic acid in particular, and to some degree nicotinamide, when they have a history of liver disease, diabetes, active peptic ulcers, gout, cardiac arrhythmia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, or alcoholism. And almost always, what's happening is they're taking nicotinic acid, There are cases of elevated liver enzymes and jaundice at as low as 750 milligrams per day of nicotinic acid, but almost all severe cases of liver toxicity are in the range of three to nine grams per day. Nausea, vomiting, and headache have been reported from nicotinamide at doses as low as 3,000 milligrams per day, and severe signs are extremely rare with nicotinamide or niacinamide as it's also marketed and are only reported at over 10 grams per day. All right, Alex, so we've talked so far about the mechanisms of toxicity in supplementation, and we've talked about the pharmacokinetics of some of these supplements, how they how they get absorbed and transported in the body. What more can you tell us about the health effects of supplementation uh, especially in humans, and and if we can fill the gaps of what we don't know with some of the animal evidence, uh, what what could you tell us? Okay, so I think that one of the most well known effects of niacin, like the thing that got it noticed first and foremost, was its use to uh, increase HDL and otherwise benefit blood lipids to reduce heart disease risk. So. We do have uh, several randomized, like large randomized controlled trials, and meta analyses of these controlled trials have shown that niacin, without a doubt, increases HDL cholesterol quite substantially, like on average, just over 20%. And it tends to reduce mortality from cardiovascular disease, uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, reduce non-fatal heart attacks, revascularization, and stroke. Uh, Those effects don't quite reach statistical significance, but I mean, they're pointing in that direction and it's close to significance. And we see this regardless of whether the niacin is taken with a statin or whether it's taken on its own. So a lot of people think that the niacin's effect is revolves around its HDL. But I don't believe that that's the case because HDL is a very poor marker for heart disease. Uh, you know, when you look at something like LDL, particle number, that is a very, very strong marker for heart disease because there's a direct relationship between the concentration of LDL particles in your bloodstream and the risk that one of them will be oxidized and trapped beneath the endothelium and be uh, taken up by macrophages. So... HDL is different. HDL's role has to do with its ability to efflux cholesterol out of the arterial walls and and get it back to the liver. And so the way that niacin increases HDL is it does so by simply inhibiting HDL uptake in the liver. Um, But it doesn't enhance the functionality of those HDL particles. And the entire biological rationale for HDL has to do with its functionality. And we even, we have studies that take a bunch of people who have different genetics that alter their HDL concentrations that show no correlation with heart disease because HDL in and of itself 
is a really bad marker for heart disease. This is also why several drug trials that focus exclusively on raising HDL uh, failed to have any beneficial impact on heart disease events. These included ones like Aim High, Illuminate, Dowel Outcomes, and HPS2 Thrive. So rather than that, the primary way that niacin appears to be beneficial for blood lipids is that it lowers LDL by about 15% on average and lowers triglycerides by about 26% on average. And this all relates to what's called the free fatty acid hypothesis, where basically niacin binds to the niacin receptor and this completely inhibits the release of free fatty acids from like your fat cells. And the primary way that VLDL and subsequently LDL is made from the liver is by packaging up any free fatty acids that hit it from your fat tissue and then excreting them out to go back to be restored, re-esterified in the fat tissue. So if you stop this flood of free fatty acids from fat tissue by binding to the niacin receptor, then you're going to deprive the liver of the essential substrate for triglyceride synthesis and secretion, uh, which appears as very low-density lipoproteins, which is therefore going to reduce LDL. And so because you're reducing LDL counts and we know that LDL is directly implicated in heart disease, that would explain why niacin has an effect on heart disease, albeit modest, regardless of its very powerful effect on HDL. And so this occurs primarily with, I mentioned this earlier, but this is going to be primarily with the nicotinic acid that will make you flush and make you hate life temporarily. But it's also with the branded uh, extended release niacin like niaspan, the pharmaceutical version. So you see these effects with both, uh, but we don't see them with slow release niacin like inacetyl hexanicotinate or the niacinamide uh, because they just work on different pathways uh, they're metabolized differently, and so they don't have the same effects. So, how do the how do the effect sizes, meaning the you know the size of the benefit that you get, the reduction of heart disease, how does that compare to some of the negative effects that have been found? Okay, so you know any reduction in heart disease risk is is going to arguably be a good thing, right? And the primary side effects of using niacin are largely avoidable. Uh, and if they aren't largely avoidable, then they're just going to be annoying, but they aren't like concerning from a health standpoint, right? So you have the flush, for example. The flush is annoying and it is possible to make it go away by building up a tolerance to using niacin. But let's say it doesn't go away for whatever reason. Well, it's not like it's going to harm you. It's just going to make you a tomato. Um, the other one is liver harm like that. That's a real concern, but it seems to be completely preventable. Keeping in mind, we don't have any actual studies on this, but from a biological standpoint, it seems to be completely preventable by just eating a diet that's rich in methyl donors because it's a depletion of methyl groups in the liver that's causing the liver damage. Now, another possible side effect is diabetes. Niacin therapy is associated with a significant risk of diabetes. In fact, uh, one meta-analysis of over 26,000 people from 11 studies showed that the risk of getting diabetes was 34% over placebo. And when we translate that to absolute terms, it suggests that about for every 43 people treated with niacin over a five-year period – one of those people will develop diabetes compared to as if those 43 people were treated with a placebo. So Alex, how does that compare to the number of people that you would save from getting heart disease? Right. So if every one out of 43 people who use niacin is going to get diabetes, 
uh, comparatively, it would be one out of every 18 people would be saved from dying from cardiovascular disease. And so when, you know, an argument could be made what's worse, having diabetes or dying. But I think that, you know, most of us could agree that they would rather have diabetes and work to manage that condition than to die from heart disease. Well, I think that you could say that like in certain contexts, but I think you could also say that um, you would hope for a drug or a dietary approach or a lifestyle approach or whatever that has a better ratio than um, than giving diabetes at like 40% of the rate that it is effective at heart disease. Right. But I think the diabetes risk is completely avoidable as well. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, I think it has to do pretty much entirely with the timing of the niacin supplements and the fact that most people using them are going to be eating every single meal rich in both fat and carbohydrates uh, for the most part. So when you look at what uh, niacin does when it binds the niacin receptor, remember how I said that it completely blunts the release of free fatty acids from the fat tissue. This effect is going to occur for about one and a half to two hours after you take the niacin. That's when it's going to be maximal. And it's associated, since you don't have any free fatty acids in the blood, but your body still needs energy, it's associated with a threefold increase in carbohydrate oxidation. So your body becomes a carb-burning machine during the first you know, roughly two hours after you take that niacin. But what happens is if you imagine niacin binding to that niacin receptor being like a lock on the gate, you're going to have all of those free fatty acids behind the gate banging on it, trying to get out, trying to get out. And they do. After about two and a half to three hours, we see that there's a free fatty acid rebound where concentrations spike fourfold above what they were before you even took the niacin. And that huge spike in free fatty acid concentrations is associated with a 70% decline in carbohydrate oxidation, which makes sense because having a bunch of fat in the blood impairs the body's ability to use carbohydrates as an energy source. Uh, this relates to the Randall cycle. Uh, which is something maybe Chris will do a podcast on in the future. But the point being that people, when they're taking niacin, they're usually dosing it throughout the day where they're going to be taking like 500 milligrams with breakfast, 500 milligrams at lunch, and then again with dinner. That's the standard dosing protocol is 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams taken with meals. And what this does is it sets people up to have extreme insulin resistance when they're eating and they're in that postprandial state. And we could, you know, logically, if you have a huge free fatty acid rebound, so you have a bunch of fat in your blood and then you eat a bunch of bagels and you have a bunch of glucose coming in your bloodstream, your body is going to essentially be in a state of diabetes temporarily because you're going to be in a state of insulin resistance from all the free fatty acids in your blood, but then suddenly you're going to have a bunch of blood glucose in there too that somehow needs to get dealt with, but your body's insulin resistant. So are these people that are eating, they're eating bagels between meals? Well, this these effects occur over a six-hour period, and most people are snacking throughout the day. So you're going to have these specific... Like, it doesn't matter what you eat when you take niacin. Niacin is going to bind that receptor and increase carbohydrate oxidation during the first two hours after you take it, like regardless of what you eat. But then during the three to six hours after that, your body is going to have free fatty acid concentrations that are one and a half to fourfold greater than what they were before you took any niacin. And people during this whole time frame are going to be snacking on food that will usually be a mix of both fat and carbohydrate. So, so how do you time that in a way that avoids that problem? 
So if you want to like get really anal about it, then I would say that when you take niacin, you would want to try to take niacin and follow it up with a meal that is primarily carbohydrate with very little fat to take advantage of that increased carbohydrate oxidation and insulin sensitivity that accompanies the suppression of free fatty acids in the bloodstream. Now, if you take niacin and then you wait to eat, then you would want to eat a meal that is very low in carbohydrate because your body is going to be running primarily on fat from three to six hours after you take it, which means that you don't want to throw more carbohydrates into the mix because your body's in a temporary state of insulin resistance. So if you were setting this up, let's say you took a dose in the morning, you would want your breakfast to be very to be more of your carbohydrates for the day and then your lunch which would come probably, you know, several hours after you eat breakfast and maybe 6 or so hours after you take that niacin, that lunch would be a fatty meal. Uh, if you were to then dose your niacin, you could then do the same thing with dinner, where then you dose your niacin again before dinner, and then you eat a high-carbohydrate dinner to take advantage of that oxidation. And then if you took a third dose of niacin, you could take it before bed and then just not worry about anything because you're not eating. That sounds worth testing, but practically very complicated. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it's fun food for thought, and I'm pretty sure that your audience is big enough where at least one person out there will give it a shot. So I, one thing that I'm wondering is is like if if you are cycling, like let's say you take the niacin, and in the two hours after that, you expect to burn on carbs, and then two or three hours after that, you expect to have a big fat bomb, whether you eat fat or not, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you take advantage of the, like the metabolism makes sense, but if you are, if you're leveraging the carbohydrate oxidation for two or three hours after you take the niacin, and then you're leveraging the fat bomb by doubling the fat bomb, half from your fat stores and half from your from your food, at what point are you actually, on average, even lowering free fatty acids? Um, you know, are, like, are you actually, on average, through the day in total, lowering circulating free fatty acids? And if not, then what is the point of the niacin? Like, are is that gonna? Can you really retain the, um, the hypolipidemic properties of the niacin if you are? expecting to cycle up and down with with like two hours of carbohydrate, two or three hours of double fat bomb, two or three hours of carbohydrate, two or three hours of double fat bomb. Like how does the math average out? Right. So something to keep in mind about when when we eat fat is that you're not absorbing free fatty acids. Uh, we're going to be absorbing primarily triglycerides and those don't have the same uh, insulin interference effect. Now there is, there is, it's well established that there is spillover when the lipases on your fat cells work on those chylomicrons to pull out the fat, the triglycerides, some of the free fatty acids then escape into circulation. And that effect is more pronounced in people with obesity compared to leaner individuals, but it does occur and it's that that's probably going to be more pronounced if you're getting the fat bomb released from the from the rebound post niacin, right? Which I mean, what would you guess? Well, that rebound is going to come right from your fat cells because it's like they were banging on the gate to get out. But I let's imagine that there's two doors, right? So one of these doors is where niacin locks them in and they're all standing behind it trying to get out. The other door is like, hey, entry only. And that's where all of the chylomicrons and their triglycerides are coming in to like put new prisoners inside this little cell. But some of the prisoners, because you're trying to cram so many through this little door, some of them escape out into circulation with all of the ones that busted through in that rebound effect. But I the two things are in essence mutually exclusive. Like your fat cells are going to be taking up fat from the meal, 
while all of these other free fatty acids have escaped from them and then are working to be reincorporated back into VLDLs and secreted back towards the fat cells. I'm, do you, I mean, do you, th I think that like it, it makes some sense, but um, do you think that, I mean, my, my, so my guess, right, is that when, when you're taking up triglycerides from chylomicrons, you are doing it by, you're freeing the free fatty acids in the, um, you're in basically in the capillaries that are nourishing the tissue that you're getting to. And so I, I think you do have mixing of the fatty acids coming in and out and the net, your net retention is going to be proportional to the, the total abundance of fatty acids there. But wouldn't it be would wouldn't it be better to just be fasting during that time? Um, in other words, if you have this outflux of fatty acids, isn't that kind of like the time where you don't actually need to be snacking? So I, if when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking what I would want to do is eat my carbs with my niacin and then not snack after that because I'm having this big out flushing of fatty acids and I should under those conditions be able to just subsist on this, you know, double, doubled ability to release my own fat from my fat source and use that for energy. Yeah. So I definitely agree with that. Um, a lot of people, particularly the ones who are taking niacin to lower their blood lipids, are going to be in a state of metabolic flexibility where, uh, you know, they might not be able to go that long between meals. So while I agree, yeah, fasting would be best. In fact, even better would be take niacin and then go do some low intensity cardio three to four hours afterwards so that you can burn off all that fat that just got released from your fat cells. Right. So like if you're a bodybuilder who wants to lean out, you know, people do fasted cardio. Well, do fasted cardio, you know, three to four hours after you take a high dose of niacin, because then you're going to have more substrate that you can burn off. Since one of the major issues in lean people is that your access to your body fat is so much lower relative to like your protein and carbohydrate stores in your muscle tissue. Um, so yeah, that would be ideal. But if for whatever reason you can't fast during that time because you get hungry or whatever, then, you know, perhaps just eat some lean protein or if you have to eat fat, then that would be the time to do it uh, simply so that you're not going against the grain. You're more working with the state that your body's already in. Yeah, so I guess like the take home point that can apply to everyone is that if you don't want to be the one in 43 people who take nicotinic acid to lower their blood lipids and get diabetes, then your best protection uh, against that is whatever else you might be doing two or three hours after you take the niacin leading up to the next dose that you take. Whatever else you do, you shouldn't be snacking on carbs. Is that the take-home point? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, and in that same vein, at least for uh, people who are concerned about fat balance, uh, eating fat within two hours after taking niacin isn't a good idea either, simply because your body is going to be in a state of prioritizing carbohydrates as an energy source, which means any dietary fat you eat is going to be preferentially stored in your fat tissue while it preferentially burns away carbohydrates. And so taking niacin must cause obesity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only it was that simple. All right, so this is sort of like the... Um, this is the, the, the non-trendy kind of like what my dad and grandma might have been doing with niacin. What can you tell us about the health effects of the currently trendy fancy pants, nicotinamide riboside, NMN? What's going on in the health and longevity space with this stuff? Oh my God, I wish I was a mouse or a rat. Um, so we have a lot of really cool research 
in uh, rodents and very little in humans showing that mega doses. And when I say mega dose, uh, I want to just go to the pharmacokinetic studies real quick, right? These people were taking 2000 milligrams per day uh, as like a top dose. And that's considered a really high dose. So when you're comparing that really high dose to animal studies, uh, they are somewhat comparable, right? So a lot of these studies in rats and mice use 300 to 400 milligrams per kilogram, which after you correct it to the human equivalent dose for a 70 kilogram man is about 1,700 to 2,300 milligrams. So they are in range with one another. But uh, mice and rats also have vastly higher metabolisms when you correct for body weight, right? So three to six times higher. And that means that they're going to be burning through a lot more NAD because they need more energy all the time. Uh, it gets back to what Chris was hypothesizing about the requirements for niacin being greater in children because and infants because they're growing. It's the same and in athletes because they're burning through a lot of NAD uh, to fuel their exercise. So these uh, studies in mice and rats might show benefits, uh, amazing benefits, because their metabolic rates are so much more active. Whereas in humans, we uh, don't have as much degradation of NAD where supplying it exogenously isn't going to have as apparent of an effect, even though the doses are relatively similar. And the results are impressive. Right. So we have a fair amount of data in rodents as well as in test tubes showing that uh, intracellular NAD concentrations are important for preventing oxidative DNA damage and gene mutation, as well as activating CERT 1 and CERT 3, which are important for telomere el elongation, um, which the telomeres are the little like shoelace caps at the end of DNA. And it's hypothesized that when those deplete, a cell stops replicating. So if we're able to protect those or possibly elongate them further, then it's really good for lifespan and health span. And uh, these have implications for, you know, several disease states, um, such as Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, but they don't necessarily seem to play out in humans, at least not with uh, nicotinamide riboside. And I was able to locate two studies. Both of them, by the way, uh, were run by employees of a company that makes NR, and the studies were sponsored by that company. So one of the studies was in 24 older adults who gave them 1,000 milligrams of NR per day for six weeks. And they went to see what happens. And the only effects, the only significant effects that they noticed in these group of older adults was a very small reduction in blood pressure of two to four millimeters mercury. But out of all the other stuff they tested, like endothelial function, artery flow, mediated dilation, uh, energy expenditure, respiratory quotient, physical activity, body composition, glucose and insulin, insulin sensitivity, their motor function, exercise capacity, exercise performance, none of those changed. And this was with 1,000 milligrams per day over six weeks. And, and these people, were they, were they athletes or were they just uh, you know, your regular average Joe off the street? No, these, these are just your average Joe older adults, right? So they had to be all postmenopausal women or men that were over 50 years of age. And so these are the people who, you know, lower NAD levels are associated with aging. These are the people who you would expect to see a benefit in, you know, outside of a disease state. And yet taking a huge dose of 1,000 milligrams every day for six weeks seem to have basically no health effect. Uh, certainly not health effects anywhere near as comparable to interventions like intermittent fasting. So the second study was in obese men with insulin resistance who took 2,000 milligrams per day for 12 weeks. 
and it's by the same group of researchers. So this time they ditched the older people. They decided to get some middle-aged folk who had obesity, and they said, we're going to make them take twice as much for twice as long. And these people are insulin resistant, so let's see what happens. And nothing. They use the gold standard euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp to measure insulin sensitivity, and there was no benefit. There was no change in resting energy expenditure, respiratory quotient, body composition, fasting, glucose, or insulin, HbA1c. In fact, the only statistically significant effect that they saw was that it actually increased their fasting triglycerides by about 20% or 26 milligrams per deciliter. And that's not a good thing. So these are the these are the people who are selling the nicotinamide riboside. So what what is the positive spin that they they put on this? I like let's let's see what the conclusions that they're coming to are from this. Okay, well, for starters, uh, their title was pretty funny, right? So it's a twenty percent increase in triglycerides, and the title of the study is called a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial of nicotinamide riboside in obese men, safety, insulin sensitivity, and lipid mobilizing effects. So, you know, saying lipid mobilization is a really polite way of saying it increased their fasting triglycerides, which is a known cardiovascular disease risk factor. So we have this we have this pulled up here and the conclusion is 12 weeks of nicotinamide riboside supplementation in doses of 2000 milligrams per day appear safe but does not improve insulin sensitivity and whole body glucose metabolism in obese insulin resistant men and then trial registration. So um so it makes sense as a pilot run to show that there's no hugely negative effects but there's no benefits either. Right. And then even in like the results of their abstract, they report on every outcome except for triglycerides. They say insulin sensitivity, endogenous glucose production and glucose disposal and oxidation were not improved by NR supplementation. Similarly, NR supplementation had no effect on resting energy expenditure, lipolysis, oxidation of lipids or body composition. No serious adverse events were due to NR supplementation were observed and safety blood tests were normal. Right, So they basically say it had no effect and that it was safe, but the only statistically significant finding that they have is not mentioned anywhere. And that's a significant 20% increase in fasting triglycerides. And as a final amusing point, they mention it once in their discussion section where they say, we observed a slight increase in the triglyceride concentration in the NR group mirrored by a slight reduction in the placebo group. But pre- and post-treatment values were within the normal reference range in both groups. Okay, so I really do want to emphasize that the data we have in animals is very promising. Uh, what we, but those promising features aren't apparent in the limited human data we have. And I mean, outside of the fact that these are rodents compared to humans and we're two entirely different species, uh, we don't know why this is, right? So it could be a species difference. It could relate to the amount of time that a treatment takes to manifest an effect. It could be due to dosing, but that's unlikely because uh, the human equivalent doses between rodent and human studies are similar. Uh, we, at this moment, because the research in this area is so new, we, we know that there's an effect in rodents but we don't see that effect with equivalent dosing in humans. Uh, it could possibly be that, you know, in humans, the benefit wouldn't be observed for decades. Like maybe just maintaining healthy NAD stores is going to be a good way to promote your health span as you age. Uh, but none of those effects are going to be apparent until like you've been taking this for uh, tens and tens of years down the road. So I, I actually think that that might be the biggest difference between the mouse and ra between the rodent studies and the human studies, because the lifespan of a of a mouse or a rat is about two years, right? So 
I mean, I remember I did a number of rat experiments back in the day. And, um, you know, you take young rats and they're adults by the time they're like 12 weeks old. Um, so I think, I think maybe these short-term studies in humans are just nowhere near as long in mouse weeks or, you know, like, like equate the, the species time lapse that goes on in these experiments. And all we have is just these short term, like, what did this do in a few weeks, which is half, you know, like half a lifetime for, um, for a mouse. And so I think that, I think you're sort of hitting the nail on the head here, which is if you look at, if you look at what are the processes that actually consume NAD that start breaking down when you don't have enough NAD to consume, remember energy metabolism, uh, yes, you if you if you consume enough NAD, then you might not have enough for energy metabolism. But remember, like like we were talking about with riboflavin, you know, you, like you don't sacrifice energy metabolism if you can help it, because if your choice is to prevent um, DNA mutations or to lengthen your telomeres versus to keep your heart beating, you're going to keep your heart beating, right? So. We're, we're really, where we really are imagining losing NAD and needing to replete it is in very long-term processes. It's in keeping telomeres long. It's in preventing mutations in the DNA. It's in, um, it's in repairing the DNA. And probably, if anything, my suspicion is that just as you see pellagra manifesting in the skin and the gut and the mind, you're probably going to see the strongest benefits for NAD in the skin and the gut and the mind. And I think that, I'm not sure right now, I'm not sure how to explain why the mind is so sensitive. Um, ex except, well, actually, I think if we go back to the explanation of the dementia, it seems that there's a very acute effect of having enough NAD to consume to produce neurotransmitters. And that's why you would see that effect fairly soon, you know, why you'd see that effect fairly sensitive in the mind because, because it's sort of like missing a neurotransmitter. It's like if you don't get enough calcium into your brain on a given day, or you don't get enough amino acids to make glutamate or GABA or something like that, you're going to see acute, an acute effect in the brain that's going to be, go away within um, within minutes, maybe sometimes, of getting the nutrients that you need into your body. Whereas what's going on in the skin and the gut that makes them so sensitive is that your skin and your gut are both on the outside of your body. So, and we don't appreciate this with the gut, right? Because it's inverted. Like it feels like it's inside of us, but your stomach, your esophagus, your mouth, everything through your anus is the outside of your body until nutrients are absorbed. And when you're on that, I mean, just think about whether you would want to take a crap and eat what came out, right? Like the, the, the things inside of that tube are everything imaginable on earth that you don't want inside your body. And so these things are exposed to dramatically more insults, our skin and our, and our GI tract. And the, uh, the, the Joshua Rabinowitz study in last year, 2018, they estimated that the spleen, uh, for reasons I, I can't explain, and the small intestine consume 40 times more NAD than the muscle does. And so would you really expect to see the most sensitive things in things like glucose metabolism and triglyceride disposal, where you would see the benefits over a short term in humans, I'm thinking that if you were to really look for it, if you can find someone who has skin problems from um, from excessive damage to this, like you know, who who really? St I mean, what I imagine, right? If you have excessive skin damage that you don't repair, is that you look a little older? Yeah, that's kind of hard to study. And in the gut, you know, your digestion is poor, but like these, the that's so hard to study compared to your glucose levels or your triglyceride levels. And so I think if you want to see something in the short term for humans, it's going to be in those hard to see areas. And if you're going to see something easy to find in humans, it's going to be an, an improvement in a disease state that's going to take a lot longer to show up. Yeah, yeah, I 
agree wholeheartedly. There's a lot more turnover of cells in the gut, in the skin. And so those are the areas where you might see a short-term effect. But otherwise, supplementing NAD in humans seems like its function is preventive. You're just going to keep NAD levels topped off so that the body has enough NAD to use for all of its energy metabolic processes and then have some left over that it can use to, you know, repair telomeres, uh, keep DNA stable, do all those things that promote healthy aging. And, you know, and at the end of the day, nicotinamide riboside supplementation is primarily popular in the among the anti-aging people where people are willing to spend money on something that they're never in their lifetime going to have adequate evidence will do anything because the whole premise is that if you're 50, you will see the benefit in 50 or 60 years, right? So can like if you had to make a quick judgment, I mean, we can go on for hours thinking of every little nuance, but if you had to make a quick judgment, what do you what do you think the probability is that someone is going to get longevity extension from taking somewhere between 150 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams of nicotinamide riboside every day? Uh, for longevity, I don't think there would be a benefit. For extending health span, I mean, mechanistically, it's there. But honestly, like, I just, in light of known ways to make sure that you live longer and age better, just eat a healthy diet, exercise regularly, stay active, be uh, kind to your circadian rhythm, get a lot of sleep, get a lot of sex, have fun, socialize. Like, these are all really easy things to do uh, that can't ever be replaced by simply taking a pill. So, Alex, are after doing this podcast, are you going to supplement with any form of niacin? No, uh, but I will comment uh, that I did try the whole like body recomposition thing uh, back in 2014, I think it was, where I took the niacin before my high carb meals and did all that stuff. And I felt like my muscles were fuller and that I was leaner, but it totally could have been a placebo effect. Uh, but that was the only time I've ever taken nice and I have no need to take it now. I literally just started taking nicotinamide riboside at a fairly low dose. So I got the 150 milligram capsules and I emptied out half the capsule and I took it. I have no results to report, but, um, I'll see where it goes. Okay. So let's break this down into, um, let's break this down into some kind of, uh, like, uh, quick fire, rapid response questions, around practical issues. So someone has high cholesterol, um, regardless of the other options, yay or nay, what, what should they, what should they be doing for niacin supplementation, nicotinic acid? Should they do it or not? Well, I can't say regardless of the other options, because I mean, if someone has high cholesterol, you know, first of all, get your body composition and diet on point because that'll usually resolve the issue. Uh, if you don't want to go on a statin, then give niacin a shot. But be uh, cognizant towards the fact that you need to be on top of your methyl donors in your diet. And you also should probably pay attention to when you're dosing the niacin so as to avoid the potential complications with diabetes, insulin resistance, and to capitalize on the shifts in metabolism that it promotes. And so um, if I understood your position correctly on the macronutrient timing, then if we, let's assume that we are going to take nicotinic acid to, um, to modulate blood lipids, let's just assume that we're doing that, we are going our best defense against the diabetes side effect is to not eat not snack on carbs in the 2 to 4 hour window after we take it yeah i would say the 2 to 6 hour window so i mean if you're going to eat any carbohydrates after you dose a high amount of nicotinic acid uh, anything above 500 milligrams then you want to eat any carbs you plan on eating within two hours. But then after that, just, you know, keep the bread away. And do we want to, if we are going to take nicotinic acid for that very purpose, are we, uh, should we be taking the immediate release, the slow release or the extended release? 
take either the extended release or the immediate release, but not the slow release. Um, both the extended release, which is uh, branded as niospan in the pharmaceutical world, and the just regular nicotinic acid, the immediate release, are going to have benefits towards your blood lipids. So I would add to the macronutrient timing, I would add that the, the, I think the safest way to accommodate the nicotinic acid is to make sure that you are repleting any glycine that you might lose and any methyl groups that you might lose. And that would indicate that for every, let's say, every 100 milligrams of nicotinic acid that you have, that you should have 50 milligrams of glycine, assuming that it all gets detoxified as glycine, which is an overestimate, and that you should have about the same 100 milligrams as a reliable methyl donor. In my opinion, the best thing to take is trimethylglycine. And that's not because you couldn't use methyl groups from choline or you couldn't use methyl groups from methionine or you couldn't use methyl groups from folate and B12. It's just because trimethylglycine is, is primarily used as a methyl donor and it's fairly easy to estimate the dose that you would need, whereas it's a bit harder to estimate the dose that you would need with one of the other methyl donors just because they're not it, it, it's just uh, their co metabolism is a little more complex. So if I were to take nicotinic acid, and I'm not saying there are any studies that justify this, uh, but theory makes sense, and I think it's harmless, that let's say I was taking 1,000 milligrams per day of nicotinic acid. If it got to that dose, I would want to take, uh, I would probably get trimethylglycine in 500 milligram capsules, take um take the TMG at the same time that I take the nicotinic acid, take fi uh, 500 milligrams of glycine or a few grams of collagen. So that's, that's only <laughs> that's a gram and a half of collagen powder. So I already take that amount of collagen. But if I weren't, I'd, I'd add that in and I'd split it across the dosing. Just make sure that not that you're going to alter the metabolism of the nicotinic acid so much. It's just that if the nicotinic acid does place demands on the methyl groups or places demands on the glycine stores, you just have that backup to make sure that you're not being depleted. Do you think uh, for any type of niacin, um, take it with food or take it fasting or doesn't matter? So with the nicotinic acid, you know, as we discussed, if you take it with food, it should be carbohydrates. Um, but generally speaking, uh, like in terms of absorption and effectiveness, it doesn't matter if you take it with food or without. So I would add to that, that I think that you want for, ma for maximum retention and utilization, I think you want to take it with food, not because it's going to impact the absorption. The absorption seems to be extremely effective regardless of conditions, but because ATP levels are going to help retain and utilize that niacin, then I think no matter what form you're taking, it's ideal to take it with food. For any type of niacin that's not nicotinic acid, I would not care about repleting the glycine, but I would keep the same methyl donor recommendation. So personally, I decided to start playing around with nicotinamide riboside a little bit. I didn't take it with any special methyl donors because I ate it with my, my eggs. And so I ate four eggs, and I got a boatload of methionine, I got a boatload of choline, and that's more than I, I would take. But if you're eating a diet that's not very rich in animal protein, that's not very rich in choline, then I think that's when it makes a lot of sense to just say, hey, as, a, as an extra insurance, I'm going to include this TMG in here just to make sure that I'm not messing with my methyl group supply. All right, cool. This was awesome. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. We will see you in the next episode. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. 
There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in, and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believe that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. Vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. 
Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. All right. I hope you enjoyed this, everybody. If you want more of me, you can find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com. If you want more of Alex Leaf, you can find him at alexleaf.com. If you don't yet have a copy of Testing Nutritional Status, The Ultimate Cheat Sheet mentioned in this episode, you can get your copy at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash cheat sheet. Use the code masteringnutrition for $5 off. If you want a transcript of this episode, sign up for the CMJ Masterpass. You don't just get transcripts of all the episodes. You also get the episodes early. You get them free of ads. You get the same benefits for Chris Master John Light, my short practical tips. Often you get those weeks or months before they come out to the public. You also get access to a monthly and sometimes more Ask Me Anything that takes place over Zoom, where you can ask anonymous questions over text, or you can ask regular questions over text, or you can even share your webcam and ask your question on the screen. If you feel like you'd love any of these things, you can check out CMJ Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass slash mastering nutrition. Using that link or clicking the link in the description of this episode will get you a 10% lifetime discount. Since this episode is episode 62, you can find the show notes at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 62. All right. I hope you found this useful. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next episode.